The next item of business is a statement by Derek Mackay, medium term financial strategy. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement, so there should be no interventions or interruptions. I call on Derek Mackay, Cabinet Secretary. Ten minutes, please, or thereabouts. Presiding officer, I am pleased to set out the Scottish Government's second annual medium term financial strategy. When I made the equivalent statement a year ago, I noted that Scotland's public finances were set in the context of continuing UK government austerity, Brexit uncertainty and an inhumane hostile approach to immigration. Disappointed to say that these still set the context for our public finances today. This is a time of unprecedented austerity. At the end of last year, UK public spending as a share of national income had fallen for a ninth successive year in a row. The only time that this has happened since the Second World War. The Resolution Foundation has highlighted that it particularly affects low and middle income households. Between 2010-11 and 2019-20, our block grant for day-to-day -day spending has fallen by £2 billion. The decision to pursue a path of austerity by successive chancellors means that over £12 billion less has been invested in the Scottish public services over the last nine years. But let me be clear, austerity is a choice and not one of Scotland's making. The UK Government's policy of austerity is both unnecessary and counterproductive. Leaving the European Union is not in Scotland's interests either. It's also not Scotland's will. Uncertainty is leading to subdued growth and leaving the EU will compound that impact. The effect of leaving the EU is clearly seen in the economic forecast for Scotland with growth forecast to fall from 1.3% in 2018 to 0.8% in 2019. The growth forecast has been downgraded and the Scottish Fiscal Commission is clear that this is directly related to the ongoing uncertainty created by the UK's EU negotiation process. Indeed, they highlight that the uncertainty caused by Brexit has prevented them from revising up their outlook for the Scottish economy and they expect business investment to continue to fall in 2019 and 2020 as a result, limiting growth in the economy. So let that sink in for a second. The independent forecasters of our economy have said if it would not for continued Brexit uncertainty, they would be forecasting faster economic growth, not slower. There is now uh, no doubt that Brexit is hurting Scotland before it has even happened. During the 2014-20 EU budget round, Scotland is estimated to receive over £5 billion in funding from the EU supporting jobs, delivering infrastructure, sustaining rural communities, and delivering research funding for our universities. In the absence of firm commitments, we cannot yet quantify levels of funding in the future and the impact that this will have on the Scottish budget. However, the Scottish Government has been clear that given that Scotland voted overwhelmingly against leaving the EU, funding levels should not be reduced as a result of the UK's exit, nor should these funds be centralised in London. Against this backdrop of UK austerity and uncertainty, we're committed to using our powers in a balanced and responsible way to stimulate the economy, protect public services and provide people and businesses with as much certainty as possible. Decisions made in the 2019-20 budget ensure that 55% of income taxpayers in Scotland in 2019-20 will continue to pay less than people earning the same income in the rest of the UK while still raising the revenue needed to support investment in the Scottish economy and public services. Had we applied UK income tax policy in 2019-20, we would have been over £500 million uh, with less to spend. So growing and supporting the economy is essential for financial stability and for providing the resources for our public services. Our economic action plan sets out the actions that will deliver sustainable inclusive growth, improve well-being and attract investment across Scotland. Over £1 billion has so far been committed to city, region and growth deals over the next 10 to 20 years and the aim is to ensure that every part of Scotland benefits through 100% coverage. We have recently introduced the legislation that will underpin the Scottish National Investment Bank, an institution that will help shape our economy through mission-led patient investments. And under the National Infrastructure Mission, annual infrastructure investment will be £1.56 billion higher in 2025-26 uh, than the £5.2 billion we're already investing in 2019-20. 
I can also confirm today that I've accepted the recent recommendations of the Scottish Futures Trust to adopt the mutual investment model as one means of supporting infrastructure spending, which will extend the range of tools at our disposal to provide crucial capital investment in Scotland. Now, alongside the MTFS, the Scottish Fiscal Commission has published new economic and fiscal forecasts. And as I said earlier, the negative economic impact of leaving the EU is clearly demonstrated in the forecast, with economic growth forecast to fall from 1.3% in 2018 to 0.8% in 2019. However, the forecasts also point to a resilient Scottish economy with employment rising further over the next five years, unemployment remaining at near record lows and earnings accelerating. The SFC has also produced updated income tax forecasts. These have increased in every year from 2018-19 over the forecast period relative to the SFC's December forecast. For 2019-20, the forecast of income tax revenues has risen by £20 million, largely driven by an improved outlook for earnings. However, forecasts for the block grant adjustment deducted from the budget each year have gone up by even more. This means that the net contribution of income tax to the 2019-20 funding envelope on the basis of current estimates is about £188 million smaller than forecast in December. This position is indicative. The 2020-21 budget will be determined by the next round of forecasts by the SFC and the OBR in the autumn. So I've set out in this medium-term financial strategy a set of principles and policies that will guide the use of our borrowing and reserve powers. Decisions are guided by the principles of sustainability, stability, budget flexibility, intergenerational fairness, value for money and transparency. But it should be clear that the circumstances that determine the use of our powers will often depend on factors beyond our control, with UK government spending decisions continuing to be the main factor in determining the Scottish budget. On capital borrowing, the MTFS sets out plans to borrow £450 million this year and £350 million next year, and it is our policy to borrow between £250 million and £450 million annually over the remaining period of the National Infrastructure Mission to ensure that investment increases overall year on year. Uh, to ensure that there is flexibility to undertake capital borrowing when it might be most needed, a contingency of £300 million of the capital borrowing limit will be left unused. And I think that this strikes the right balance between supporting the economy and the prudent use of the restrictive borrowing powers contained in the fiscal framework. Finally, let me turn to the framework for the spending review. The UK Chancellor committed to a spending review this summer. However, in the context of continuing uncertainty over Brexit and the impending change of Prime Minister, it is, like most things relating to the UK government, unclear if that will actually take place. Nonetheless, reflecting the importance of sustainable public finances, the Scottish Government plans to undertake reviews of spending beyond 2020-21. And we will fulfil our commitment made during budget of 2019-20 uh, to bring forward a three-year settlement for local government in 2020-21. In line with the National Performance Framework, the spending review focus it will be on creating a more successful country with opportunities for all of Scotland to flourish through increased wellbeing and sustainable inclusive economic growth. It will be driven by a strategic focus on addressing Scotland's long-term challenges. And for resource, we currently plan to publish indicative budgets in December 2019 alongside the Scottish Budget 2020-21. However, if we do not have sufficient clarity from the UK Government eh, on its spending plans at that stage, that may not be possible. We will expect resource spending proposals to focus on outcomes and to evidence, so as far as possible, the impact on the specific challenges and opportunities we face around securing sustainable and inclusive economic growth, improving national well-being, combating child poverty and meeting our statutory targets, and tackling climate change and the climate crisis. For capital, future budgets will be published by June 2020 to take account of the Infrastructure Commission's findings to be reported at the end of December 2019 and the Scottish Government's next Infrastructure Investment Plan, which will be informed by the Commission's advice. It is clear from what I've said already that the resources available to the Scottish Government will be constrained by continued UK austerity. And we recognise that we will not be able to do all that we want to do or all that others want us to do 
Prioritisation will be necessary to focus resource where it will have the biggest impact. And I now uh, look forward to a responsible debate on how we best uh, deliver those outcomes and I commend this medium-term financial strategy to the Chamber. Uh, thank you. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in the statement. I intend to allow about 20 minutes for questions, after which we need to move on to the next item of business. I can ask those members who wish to ask a question to press the request to speak button. So now Colin Murdo Fraser. Mr Fraser. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by thanking the Finance Secretary for advanced sight of his statement, although he'd redact redacted so much of the key data. It was, frankly, of little value. And I have to say to him, he made a false statement in the foreword to this Document. This document says there's been a £2 billion real terms reduction to our block grant since 2010. As the Cabinet Secretary knows perfectly well, that is an untrue statement. Yeah. According to SPICE, the block grant is up in real terms since 2010, so I think he should start by apologising for misleading uh, Parliament in respect of that particular statement. Presiding officer, the latest data shows that despite Brexit, the UK economy performs well, with record high employment, growth exceeding Germany, and according to the IMF, growth over the next five years projected to exceed their Western European average. That is under a Conservative government. In contrast, in Scotland, under an SNP government, we have a dismal picture that's been painted this afternoon with growth projected to lag well behind the UK and the gap to grow between average UK performance and Scottish performance. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, are we now in the uh, area of the potential Scotland-specific economic shock and what is he going to do with the powers at his disposal to address this? And secondly, uh, presiding officer, he announced today a £180 million reduction in forecast income tax receipts according to the Fiscal Commission figures. That's on the back of previous income tax shortfalls forecast from 2017-18 of £145 million and from 2018-19 of a staggering £472 million. How will the Cabinet Secretary fill the gap created by his policies. Will he be increasing taxes, and if so, on whom and by how much? Or will he be cutting spending, and if so, where? People deserve to know the truth. Cabinet Secretary. First of all, presiding officers, you would expect everything I ever say in this chamber is true and will continue to be uh, true. Uh, the Tories uh, clearly cannot make up their minds. The Tories cannot make up their minds when we have got good economic indicators in Scotland. They think that I've got a responsibility in the Scottish economy. When they're less good, they think it's nothing to do with them and it's all the Scottish Government. But in fact, on GDP, Scotland is outperforming the rest of the United Kingdom. The most recent uh, quarter is an example of that. And Murdo Fraser mentions uh, unemployment. We've got record low unemployment in Scotland right now, also outperforming the rest of the United Kingdom. And when Murdo Fraser has the time, I'm sure he'll look through in great detail at the SFC report, the reason for subdued growth in Scotland is Brexit. Of course, that is the fault of the Conservatives in the UK and a, a damaging Scotland's economy by the decisions and the mismanagement uh, that they are now in control of. And in terms of that a accusation around underperformance, the SFC have shown that Scottish GDP growth will be slower than UK GDP growth over the forecast period, primarily because of slower population growth in Scotland. Who controls population growth in Scotland? The UK government over powers of migration. We have an economic action plan that will grow our economy, specifically in relation to income tax uh, reconciliation. The, the scale of any reconciliation is uncertain until we have the actual outturn uh, data. There would always be volatility. The SFC uh, have uh, admitted that. But they actually shows increases. They have shown increases in income tax uh, in terms of forecast for Scotland over the forecast period relative to the December forecast. Cumulatively, an increase of over £430 million between 2017-18 and 2023-24, largely driven by an improved outlook for earnings. Now, the SFC notes that due to historic forecast errors for such a large tax, eh, there will be negative reconciliations. That should not be unexpected. And we may see extended periods of positive reconciliations eh, into the future. So we have been acting to grow our economy. There's also vindication for putting some resources eh, into the reserve so that that can be managed if there is that volatility. We also have borrowing powers as well. But we are confined and bound by austerity as well. But Murdo Fraser is only truly happy when he's utterly miserable.
the Tory position in Scotland seems to be that they celebrate that Brexit will do less damage in England than in Scotland. Presiding officer, we have balanced the books. We will continue to balance the books using all the powers at my disposal in a responsible and sustainable way. Now, before, before we move on, I've been quite light here, but that was a bit of a mini statement, so I, and you know well it was. So we can have crisp answers, please. I call James Kelly to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I thought the Cabinet Secretary was getting another 10-minute statement there. Uh, can I thank him, though, for advance copy of his statement, uh, even though the number of kind of black marks throughout the statement were really consistent with the theme of the black holes in uh, Scotland's public finances. Um, the, the, bleak <laughs> the, the bleak figures announced today, uh, specifically the Cabinet Secretary indicating that there is a potential 188 million less in the spending envelope for 2019-20. Uh, it will worry those that care about what's going on in Scotland's communities. So people that have to wait hours and hours uh, for ambulances, families with kids at school that see education resources having to be cut by councils, and those that uh, are stranded on train station platforms with trains that don't turn up in time as they await journeys to work, uh, will not welcome today's uh, statements. Can I specifically ask the Cabinet Secretary then, uh, what action in terms of the medium financial term financial strategy is he going to take uh, to address the gap in Scotland's public finances and also the gaping hole in Scotland's public services. Cabinet Secretary, mindful of what I said previously. The uh, redactions in the uh, statement are those that have been agreed by the protocols of the Parliament around that sensitive data. That shouldn't be news to anyone. We've been doing it since we've had this uh, sensitive data. It was better than the alternative budget I got from the Labour Party, which was a total blank page, never mind a few redactions from a statement and a report. We will continue to invest in the public service of Scotland, oppose austerity, try and mitigate the, the impact of uh, a Brexit. Should it happen, there's an opportunity to avert Brexit. If we actually did that, if we were able to avert Brexit and end austerity, there would be a massive windfall to the public resources of Scotland because we would be able to invest in the way that the Tories have constrained us. In terms of the powers that we have, I've been balancing the books responsibly, allocating some resources to reserve. It was opposed, if I remember correctly, by the Labour Party, uh, but also use uh, the uh, reserve borrowing powers, if required, in terms of that uh, forecast uh, error, if that comes to pass. We'll have more data on that and then we'll respond uh, accordingly, but a way that gives sustainability for public services. Thank you, Patrick Harvey, followed by Willie Rennie. Thank you. I, I'm grateful for the advanced copy of the statement, and I'm pleased that green influence on tax policy has meant that there is more money available for Scotland's public finances than there would have been if we hadn't changed tax policy. And if, if Murdo Fraser is worried about who's going to be paying more tax next, I would be very happy if he and his classic motto were next in line. Can I ask the First Secretary if he's, if he's seen uh, the analysis from SPICE about six months ago about the pipeline of capital investment and foreshadowing the, the threat that there's going to be a shift back in the direction of high carbon capital projects in the existing pipeline. How is this consistent with the government's commitment to continually shift capital spend away from high carbon and toward low? Why should we believe that the cabinet secretary is right and Spice are wrong at the moment? Cabinet Secretary. But for the reasons that Patrick Harvey's just given, if that was a six-month-old report, what we have to look at is our current uh, uh, infrastructure investment pipeline. Clearly, the First Minister's declared a climate emergency, and our policies should, should suit that investment plan. That the uh, uh, Infrastructure Commission will also advise us, and we'll take the time to recalibrate our, our, our capital spending plan. So there is now the opportunity to recalibrate capital spending, including the principle that we set out in a budget negotiation to invest more in low carbon. We've now made a commitment uh, in terms of the reduction in emissions, and of course our spending commitments must follow that as well. There's now an, uh, an opportunity to influence those commitments. Will there be any followed by Bruce Crawford? Last year we had a catastrophic forecasting error for income tax. Uh, the impact <clears throat> was initially on the, only on the baseline. However, the lower income tax forecasts are still expected to have an impact on the 2021 budget and the year after. 
So can the Finance Secretary tell me how much the approximate scale of the negative reconciliation requirements, or known as cuts to everyone else, for the next years have changed since the news of this error from the Fiscal Commission and the OBR was released last year. He talks about £188 million worth of change. What does that leave for cuts to the budget? Cabinet Secretary. Well, again, I, th I think you, Willie Rennie shouldn't conclude um, the one option for the budget when we have uh, a range of levers that we can deploy if there is forecast error because of the SFC forecast, which does include use of reserves, uh, borrowing, uh, yes, we may have to look at expenditure as well. So there are a range of tools that we can deploy in the knowledge that there, I think, will be a substantial uh, variation in that forecast. What's actually changed uh, substantially is uh, the OBR's forecast. Their own forecast is what's changed in terms of the block grant adjustment rather than necessarily just focusing on the SFC. That's just one part of the story. Uh, details are throughout uh, the SFC uh, report and the medium term financial strategy but I think right now we should prepare uh, for that but also bear in mind that the outturn figures in July are absolutely critical here because that will be outturn figures that then help us in the next uh, round of forecasting which will be the one that sets the budget but it is wrong to conclude that there are cuts to the Scottish budget when we have other uh, economic levers there are other um, levers we have to address that forecast uh, er, er, error. But I, uh, I, I say again that these uh, variations uh, may well be substantial and that's uh, why we need to look at the outturn data and not just the forecast. Bruce Crawford followed by Dean Lockhart. President Officer, Murdoch Fraser has cried wolf in financial matters so often in this chamber. No one really hears he's bleating any longer. But as far as the cars are concerned, I can say that I saw Murdo recently in a very good hybrid motor, to be fair to him. I like your question, please. Uh, yeah, okay. would the cabinet secretary, Enough of the, cars. Uh, would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the, the, these indicative income tax forecasts are simply just that, they're forecasts. And as we know, with, with uncertainty about forecasts, they're almost certainly wrong. And given that the fiscal framework requires the Cabinet Secretary to pay heed to these forecasts, I wonder if he could set out his thinking on whether or not the current borrowing powers and limits that exist within the fiscal framework are sufficient to deal with the risk of forecast error. Cabinet Secretary. I suppose that partly uh, relates to Willie Rennie's point again, that if it is a substantial variation, a reconciliation that's required, it may well be uh, that the borrowing powers and the use of reserve, because of the uh, levels of drawdown that are capped, uh, that those uh, parameters may be inadequate to address the scale of adjustment that may be necessary because of reconciliation. So I think there is good reason to look again at the drawdown limit uh, so that we aren't constrained in the actions to address the reconciliation that may be required because of forecast error at the hands of the OBR and the SFC. Dean Lockhart followed by Maureen Ward. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, let's be clear, Cabinet Secretary, Scotland's economic underperformance long predates Brexit. In fact, over the past 12 years, we have seen annual economic growth of just 0.7%. And this economic stagnation is set to continue. You have uh, laid out growth forecasts. Question, just, please. Just 0.8% next year compared to 1.2% for the UK economy. So isn't it time the Cabinet Secretary recognised that his economic policy is creating a low growth, low productivity and low wage economy? Cabinet Secretary. Since I've been Economy Secretary, GDP's outperformed the forecast. Unemployment's at record low, outperforming the rest of the United Kingdom. Exports are up more than the rest of the United Kingdom. And business enterprise research and development's outperforming the rest of the United Kingdom. I think I'm doing no bad. <laughs> Maureen Watt, followed by Mark Griffin. Um, the fiscal framework sets out in page 13 how the Scottish Government's block grant is adjusted to account for the proposed VAT assignment. Could the Cabinet Secretary explain further his view on this proposal, the risks involved and the potential volatility that could impact on this Scottish Government's spending plans? Cabinet Secretary. I have appeared at the Finance Committee. I have written to the Chief Secretary of the Treasury. I am concerned about the volatility and the a lack of data that informs this. 1% error in this regard could cost the Scottish budget £100 million. So I think we have to get it absolutely right and not add to the volatility of the Scottish budget. And that's why I'm reflecting on the position as it relates to VAT, which is not a power, it's assignation. Mark Griffin, followed by John Mason. Thank you, President Officer. Given that this is a five-year plan, 
Can the Cabinet Secretary say where in the strategy are the billions of pounds needed for an income supplement that will cut child poverty and meet this Parliament's interim target in just four years' time in 2023? Cabinet Secretary. It is not intended to be a mini budget. It's not intended to set out the individual spending commitments. Uh, so I haven't done that in this process. That is something we'd consider as we approach the budget. And as I uh, heard uh, uh, Chile and Somerville say uh, just moments earlier, there'll be a further report to Parliament in terms of child poverty in June. And I'm sure the member with a keen interest in this subject will look forward to that update to Parliament. John Mason, followed by Bill Bowman. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary can comment on the, uh, whether he feels the Scottish Fiscal Commission are overly cautious in their uh, forecasts and how they compare with the OBR as far as accuracy concern, is concerned. And I mean, would he agree with me that there are always going to be variations in forecasts? And these are not errors, they are variations. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding Officer, I'm not particularly keen to give a personal judgment. We've got two sets of uh, economists giving us the, the, their forecasts. I don't propose to add a, a third view of the Scottish Government. We have to follow the both sets of forecasts. That's the agreement. That's what we're doing. But it is true to say that um, errors will be inevitable. Uh, but how we manage it, approach it and have that reconciliation is a matter for us. And that's why I'm looking very carefully uh, at it. It is true to to say, though, that uh, the different methodologies and forecast assumptions, different timings, different fiscal events, it sometimes lead to a difference in position between both forecasting organisations. Bill Bowman, followed by Emma Harper. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary speaks at length about the choice of UK austerity. Andrew Wilson's Growth Commission predicted 27 billion of austerity over 10 years. Will the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that it is the better choice to remain as part of the UK? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the austerity and notional deficit that we experience is because we've been part of the UK. The uh, UK is not the remedy to it. Independence is the remedy to a subdued economic growth. And the Growth Commission, of which I was a member, shows a pathway to deliver that sustainable economic growth that will grow public services and public investment in real terms. Emma Harper, followed by Neil Bibby. Cabinet Secretary, we know that for the Tories to remain in power, they reached an agreement with the DUP to the tune of over a billion pounds so far. If such money had been subject to Barnett consequential calculations, um, as it should have been, what does the Cabinet Secretary think would be the fiscal picture for Scotland today? Cabinet Secretary. That we would have been £3.3 billion better off. Neil Bibby, followed by David Torrance. I agree with the Finance Secretary that Brexit is having a significant impact on economic growth in Scotland and the UK. A downgrade of growth will of course affect jobs and living standards. The Scottish Government is proposing a Citizens' Assembly to discuss the Constitution again as it is their number one priority. But given the urgent need to grow our economy, why doesn't the Scottish Government instead convene a summit of industry, trade unions and economic experts to agree an urgent plan to boost Scotland's economy and the finances that support our public services? Cabinet Secretary. Because I already meet all of those people and that's why we're already seeing growth in GDP, record low unemployment, record investment in business enterprise research and development and a plan around internationalisation that's seen as enhanced our exports as well. We're doing more around innovation and inclusive growth. All of this is at threat. Well, it is actually working because of the indicators that I've just mentioned. It is absolutely working, but what's subduing, what is subduing from members who clearly haven't even read yeah. the SFC report will know what the independent forecasters are saying as the reason for subdued growth and a downgrade in performance is Brexit. Maybe the Labour Party could help us in averting Brexit. There's an idea. Yeah. David Torrance. <laughs> Thank you, President Officer. The fiscal framework was originally due to be reviewed after the UK and Scottish Parliament elections in 2020 and 2021, respectively. Obviously, a lot has changed in the preceding years, and with everything so far that has come to light, would the Cabinet Secretary foresee the possibility and the benefits of an early review of the fiscal framework? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we have an agreement in terms of the fiscal framework to allow one full parliament uh, of, of use of those powers to, to then inform that review and that debate. But I think the number of issues that Parliament and I have been raising with the Treasury, I think, would suggest that the that we should look uh, at the, that agreement to see if there can be further flexibility uh, and concession around it, because it will have an impact on the public finances of Scotland. Thank you. That concludes questions on this point of order. I'm very grateful, presiding officer. On the point of order, I wonder if you and the other presiding officers could reflect upon the provision of information to uh, members of the opposition parties in advance of statements such as this. 
Uh, I've just seen it announced by the yep, Scottish Fiscal Commission. Can I just ask you to sit down just now? Because yeah. I think I was sitting here when the Cabinet Secretary said there was a protocol when there's sensitive information. I don't want to repeat what you say. It's on the record. Could I ask you to look at what's on the record first? and then return if you feel it's necessary with a point of order. Can you're referring to the redacted, it's not discussion, you're referring to the redacted parts of the statement. Oh, you're not, I beg your pardon, I beg your pardon, right? I'm grateful, President, I was not referring to the redacted mat matters, I'm referring to the Scottish Fiscal Commission forecasts, which are integral to the statement that's been just been made, and were not made available to opposition parties before the statement was, 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 was announced. The Fiscal Commission have just said, just in the last few minutes, that their reconciliations anticipate that the budget for the current oh, year will be reduced by £229 uh, million. Pounds. Sorry, the budget for next year by £229 million, pounds, and the budget for the following year by a staggering £608 million pounds due to income tax reconciliations. Now, had this information been made available to uh, opposition members prior to the statement we've just heard... Could I ask you to sit down just for a moment? Indeed. Yes, I, I hear what you're saying. I don't want to open this up to a, a debate at the moment, but we will reflect on that, and if necessary, we'll return to the point you've raised. I'm sorry I anticipated you. I thought you were going to go on for redacted points. I may now move on, with the leave of Mr Fraser, uh, to the next item of business, which is a debate on Motion 17436, in the name of Ivan McKee on a trading nation. I'll give members a few moments to take up their seats.